Hey dudes, this is Catherine Mary Stewart, Maggie in The Last Starfighter, and Reggie in Night of the Comet. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac in Splat from the Past. And remember, the whole burden of civilization has fallen upon us. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very talented and underrated director. His name is Mel Damsky. He directed the 1985 cult classic Mischief, the 50s coming-of-age teen movie with Catherine Mary Stewart, uh, Chris Nash, and Doug McKeon, three people I've had on from that movie, and he will be the fourth. I get to find out from his point of view how the whole making of that movie was. He also uh, directed so much television before and after. The Bionic Woman, Lou Grant. Um, another cult classic, Yellowbeard, with the Monty Python people, and so many others. And um, he also did the Patrick Dempsey movie, Happy Together, and um, the baseball uh, mo- uh, TV movie, A Winner Never Quits. So many great movies. And I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that stuff. And I can't wait. He's very underrated, as I said. So yeah, here is my interview with Mel Damsky. Hey, Mel. How are you, Tommy? I'm great. How are you, sir? I am wonderful considering that these are very challenging times. Yes. I'm making the best of it. Yes, we are all making the best of it. Welcome to the show, sir. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, uh, this is a this is perfect timing right now. My puppy is lie, sit lying at my feet, and it's a beautiful day up in Bellingham. I'm looking out at sunny skies, and uh, again, I feel very blessed to be in the place I am, considering the challenges we're facing right now. Wonderful, wonderful. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward film early on in your childhood? Not at all. It wasn't on my radar. I grew up in Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. There were no filmmakers in my neighborhood. It turned out later they they did end up in the industry. But, you know, I was so far away from Hollywood Uh, You know, we had theater in New York, but we didn't really have a film industry, so I didn't know anyone in that industry. And my uncle is a very famous journalist, and he uh, really inspired me, so I always thought I was going to be a lifelong reporter. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you wanted to be a journalist. Yeah, I was the sports editor of my high school and college newspapers. I I went to college on an athletic scholarship. And uh, then I became a reporter for the Suffolk Sun in Long Island, and and uh, the guy who was covering the, the uh, Long Island Nets, which was at the American Basketball Association, mm-hmm. quit to take another job. So I got to cover, you know, people like Doc, Dr. J. Julius Irving and people like Connie Hawkins, which was pretty amazing as a kid right out of college. Then I went to Newsday, which is an award-winning newspaper in Long Island. And then I just wanted to get out of New York and experience something different. And I was living with some college friends who were going to medical school. And we all chose Denver as a target. (laughs) And I ended up uh, going to University of Denver, getting a master's in mass communications. And my very first day of class, when the professor explained what the jobs were in the industry, Mm -hmm. I said, I want to be a director. (laughs) Was there a, it was that simple. Was there a certain movie you saw that made you want to direct? No, it wasn't that. It was just when I understood. To me, it's all about storytelling. Mm-hmm. I thought, what a cool <clears throat> way to tell stories. You know, this is just a wonderful way to tell stories. And and uh, it's dynamic. And I, I'm very outgoing. That's why this pandemic is so tough on me. Mm-hmm. I am very socially oriented. And so, you know, working in the film industry where you're constantly with a different group of people and you're surrounded by lots of interesting people was perfect for me 
because I, the word routine is not in my vocabulary. Wow. So did you uh, uh, go to film school? I applied to the American Film Institute uh, while I was in Denver. Um, they, I did a documentary in Denver called the about uh, people coming across the, the you know the border with Mexico and working as farm workers, mm -hmm. and I got a lot of recognition for that. It, was, it aired in Denver on a TV station, and I used that to apply to the American Film Institute along with the, the, my journalism portfolio. And in those days, they only took 10 directors in the program. And I was accepted. And I made a short film there. Uh, I adapted a short story that turned out really well. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> way before your time, there was a producer named Quinn Martin. He mm -hmm. had a bunch of hit shows on. Yep. And he had a policy that he would take, he would look at the best films submitted by all of the major pr uh, film programs, you know, USC, UCLA, AFI, things like that. Right. And and they AFI chose my film, The Lost Phoebe, and Quinn Martin chose it of the group that year, and so I immediately got to direct an episode of Barnaby Jones right out of film school, which is pretty remarkable, right? Going right from film school to actually directing a, a TV show. And it took off from there. Just, you know, one thing that led to Lou Grant, Lou Grant led to MASH, MASH led to Yellow Beard, and I was off and running. Wow. Yeah, what, what... I stopped working. Until the pandemic came along. That's the only thing that would stop <laughs> slow me down. Yeah. <laughs> so let's start um, with The Bionic Woman. You did a couple episodes of those. Right. That was Lindsay Wagner. And uh, it was, you know, the, the thing that I never wanted to be typecast as a director. Yeah. And. You know, to do something like that, which has had a little kind of surreal element to it, mm -hmm. after doing, that was just really fun and challenging for me. And I've always, I, you know, I never wanted to be typecast. I've always wanted to try different things. And I've been very lucky to do that. And it was tough. Lindsay wasn't the easiest back in those days. I did get to work with her later and we had a better experience. But also I can understand her thinking like, you know, who is this guy? You know, what has he done? Yeah. So it, it was challenging, but it turned out well. How was uh, Richard Anderson? Lovely. Very classy. Really classy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you get along with Glenn Larson? With whom? Glenn Larson. I didn't have any contact with Glenn. Oh, okay. Really? Yeah. I, that, I, that I did not have, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then you did several episodes of Lou Grant. Uh, how was working with Ed Asner? It was fantastic. Uh, uh, and, you know, a, lo a lot of the people who were directing came from his multiple camera show, right? Multi-camera show. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't my background. And so I... I really changed the, the way we were filming. Uh, I shot it much more like a film than a multi-camera show. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really liked that. And so they, you know, and plus I got nominated for an Emmy for it. And so that's what really launched my career is, is that show. And Ed was wonderful. He had parties at his house up in Bel Air, mm -hmm. uh, which I loved going to. He was just a wonderful man. That's good. I'm supposed to be interviewing him in a couple of weeks, so hopefully uh, I'll get to. Um, is there any particular episodes that uh, stand out for you? Of that show? Of that show, yeah. Oh, God. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, know it, you know how many hours of TV I've done, right? That's a little tough for me to, 
say, "Oh, I know." I'm actually cheating. Looking at my, I'm I'm looking at myself on IMDb Pro right now just to cheat. <laughs> so I can I can find what the uh, certain directors you know they always have you know um, episodes of, of shows that they're very proud of. Yeah, well, um, I just have so many that, mm-hmm. but I can tell you. That was a show, again, that I was very, very proud of. You know, the quality of the writing was so good. The content was so good. It was really nice. Yeah, sadly it got canceled um, uh, because of uh, Ed's uh, political affiliations, uh, which I think is really silly, but um, it it did happen, though. Um, Yeah. But But please give him my best, and hopefully he'll remember me. And... uh, he was, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. He is a wonderful man. I sure will. I sure will. Then you did the uh, Notorious TV Movie of the Week for Ladies Only. Yes, with Gregory Harrison. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was pretty risque for those days, right? You couldn't yeah. do too much. But obviously it was about a stripper. So And Gregory and I have become lifelong buddies. We're always in touch. He's a big surfer. Yeah. Moved to Oregon for a while, and then I think he's living back in up near Santa Barbara. Uh, he needs to be near a surfing beach. Yeah. That's, that's his real passion, and he's a he's a really good guy. Yeah, I emailed he, him years ago, and uh, he sent me an email back. Very nice man. Yeah, yeah. If you want to connect with him, let me know. He's uh, he's a good guy. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, this is like a, an early uh, like magic mic for TV. <laughs> um, right. What what attracted you to the story? Well, I like a challenge, right? And I thought mm-hmm. it was challenging to do something like that in television, right? Which is very in those days, you couldn't be too risque, right? So I thought, right. hey, this is a pretty risque subject matter, but in a medium that you know is very controlled and I like that cha- I like a challenge for me it's all about the story am I engaged in the story and yes I was yeah how di- how does um, Yellowbeard come into your life well that's a really interesting we could do a whole hour on Yellowbeard alone <laughs> yeah. because it was so challenging I think in retrospect, I think that um, Graham Chapman wanted to direct it himself, and they didn't want to let him. Mm-hmm. Ryan did not want to make a Monty Python movie. Mm-hmm. He didn't want it as broad. They they wanted it not to be so episodic. They wanted it to be you know structured more like a regular comedy movie. Right. And so they wouldn't let Graham direct it. But basically. It, uh, looking back, how could they choose this kid, right, who had very few credits, like did do MASH, mm-hmm. to direct a movie of that size, right, shot in England and Mexico with all these famous people. Uh, I, I feel kind of cynically like maybe they were looking for a sacrificial twin lamp. Yeah. <laughs> not sure. But uh, it was, I had two producers, I'm not going to name them right now, yeah. but they both were... Both were in absentia. Mm-hmm. In other words, you would think a first-time director of my age of a feature film, right, they mm-hmm. would be there to guide me. They were never around. So I was on my own to, I got all these notes from Orion to, to get Graham and Peter Cook and Bernard McKenna to, to rewrite the script. Again, they didn't want it too broad. And so I had to be the messenger, go to London, give them these notes, mm-hmm. Peter Cook was constantly mocking me and making fun of me. <laughs> and I said, Peter, you guys collectively have 49% chance, uh, you know, ownership of the script, and right now Orion has 51%, so you have to take the notes. And he would mock me, and it got to the point where I couldn't work with him anymore, and I let uh, Mike Metaboy know at Orion, and he basically said, Either Peter drops, stops drinking or he's off the movie, meaning he wouldn't be writing or playing Lord Lamborn. 
Mm-hmm. And Peter, amazingly, Graham Chapman sat him down, read him the riot act. Peter went cold turkey, <laughs> and he and I became best friends, and we hung out together throughout the rest of the movie. Wow. And still, there was this constant conflict that, you know, the Pythons were not happy that I was asking them to do things that they didn't necessarily want to do. So it, it was an amazing, amazing challenge. And, and uh, Eric Idle, who I had a great relationship with, uh, I thought, mm-hmm. he recently wrote uh, an autobiography and he basically said, I ruined the movie. Oh. Which I, and, and I wrote him a very long, passionate letter saying, was I the right director for that movie? Absolutely not. Did I do an amazing job holding it together? Graham got caught with a 12-year-old boy in his room the first week of shooting in England. We got shut down. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? Yeah, God. Marty Feldman died during the picture. Mm -hmm. We were shooting in Mexico, England. Uh, I mean, it was amazingly challenging. Yeah. And... uh, Yet I somehow got the movie made. Is it a great movie? No, not by any means. Yeah. It does have a nice kind of cultish following. Yeah. And, uh, you know, nowadays I run into people who say, oh, my God, you directed Yellowbeard, you know, and they, they'll go, uh, you know, stagger, stagger, fall, fall, stagger to the left, stagger to the right. You know, they literally can quote dialogue from, mm-hmm. from the movie. Yeah. With, you know. David Bowie, we, we put David in the movie, and he took um, Graham Chapman and Martin Hewitt, who played his son, out on a jitney ride in Mexico and mm-hmm. had a car accident, and they were in the hospital for a week. And we were sitting at the pool every day, and, of course, David could barely look me in the eye <laughs> because of what had happened. So all these challenges, right? And then Marty died, and I have to figure out how to, you know, end this character in the movie without him for the stunt double. Yeah. So I think the fact that I got the movie done at that point with so little experience, I think I deserve a pat on the back for that, even though I wasn't the right. It should have been one of the Monty Python directors who did it. That's what they wanted. Yeah. Did, did the Orion Pictures, though, have high expectations like it was going to be a summer blockbuster? They did, and it wasn't, <laughs> for sure. It opened so soft. I remember going to the theater, uh, and, and it was like, oh, my God, it's half full. And this is like opening night, you know. So mm-hmm. I knew it was not. The problem was it wasn't a Python movie. Yeah. And that, so the <clears throat> Python fans, you know, they were saying, no, this is not a Python movie. It's got, you know, Peter Boyle and Madeline Kahn and Marty Feldman and all, you know, mm-hmm. and Sean, and that's not a Python movie. And so they kind of, you know, did not embrace it. But I think it's funny. <laughs> like yeah. It. It's hilarious. In those days, too, you know, people were taking historical concepts and making them into all-star comedies. Like uh, Mel Brooks had History of the World Part One, and um, Carl Gottlieb had Caveman. So it, it was it was it was part of a trend, you know. And yes. yeah, you had yeah, you had just so much talent in this movie. Oh my God, Marty Feldman, uh, James Mason. What was he like? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine me getting to work with James Mason, this world class actor? Yes, it was not his genre, right? Mm-hmm. Do something as broad as this. And again, Orion did not want such a broad movie, which is why we cast James Mason. And James was so wonderful to me. We were in Mexico and we had dinner together every night. Wow. It was just incredible. You know, I just wanted to be, you know, kind of asking him everything about his career because he had such an amazing career and I had so much respect for him. Mm-hmm. So that was a real plus. Yeah, I, I've, I've had dinner with a lot of my podcast guests, and, you know, I mean, obviously I interviewed them and asked them about their career and stuff, but, like, when I'm having dinner with them, I don't want I don't want to talk about their career. I want to talk about their lives, you know? <laughs> right, yes, yeah. You can read about their career, right, in the paper, but, yeah. 
That's, that's a good point. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's, it's a funny recon, reconciliation there. Uh, how was Peter Boyle? Peter was good. He was good. He was, uh, you know, again, not a Python guy, right? Mm-hmm. But, of course, he and Marty and Madeline had, had all worked together. And uh, so that was good. But he was, again, he was very nice to be. Uh, I don't think he was passionate about the project, to be honest. But, uh, he, you know, he showed up every day and did really good work. Mm-hmm. And I had uh, Stacy Nelkin earlier or, on earlier this year. She's a wonderful lady. Um, really, you did? Yeah. Oh my God, how is she? Oh, she's great. You know, she lives in New York, and uh, she helps people, um, you know, with who are having trouble um, getting uh, getting into relationships. They she basically helps people, you know, find uh, find their suitor, basically. Um, wow! Matchmaking He's type like of a thing. Matchmaker, matchmaking therapist. Kind of like a matchmaking therapist, yeah. And you know, I I I, I, talk, I just talked to her uh, like a month ago, and she said, "Have you?" And she was just checking up on me, saying, "Have you found Have you found a good girl yet?" And I'm like, "Not yet." And she's like, "And she's like, well, as soon as this pandemic is over, get your ass out there." <laughs> <laughs> Are you in the Bay Area? I was in the Bay Area for a long for most of my life, but I live in Reading now. Oh yeah, I saw that Reading. Yeah, yeah. Not proud. You know, it's a really cool <laughs> little town. Uh, is Mount Shasta? Whenever I go, you know, mm-hmm. I live up in Bellingham, but uh, often I'll take five and go down to LA and see my family. Yeah. And uh, I stop in. I always sit, stop in the town of Mount Shasta, which is an adorable little town that I never really knew about. And that's not far from when, from where you are. Yeah, I, I, it's a nice town, but it's not my town. We, we had my, my mother and I had to move up here after uh, we fell in, under some hard times in the Bay Area, trying to get to Los Angeles eventually. But um, yeah, it's good for now, you know. I wouldn't recommend Los Angeles right now for you, though. Oh yeah, for I, it, with, with the, all the insanity right now, I wouldn't. But I'm just saying, you know, like in a year or two, you know. But, yeah, maybe by then. Right. My youngest son, our youngest son's a musician, and he lives. He still lives there. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's a tough town. You know that. Oh yeah, it is. How, so, how, how did Cheech and Chong come to be in the movie? Uh, it was just. I think that was a Mike Metavoy idea. And again, you know what Mike was thinking about is okay. How am I going to sell this movie? Right? Who can I put on the poster? And, you know, he, he got Cheech and Chong to do it. But the problem was they didn't want to do a Monty Python movie. They wanted to do a Cheech and Chong movie. So, again, it was a real struggle. They wanted to ad lib, which they were very good at. And mm-hmm. the studio wanted to hold them to the script. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, not, not an easy situation. They were both very nice guys. I liked them both a lot. Yeah. But I was caught in the middle between the studio and, and them because uh, the, the studio did not want them ad-libbing too much. And that's what they do so well. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, right after this, um, they did the Corsican Brothers uh, for Orion. Yeah. Which is interesting. They're yeah. so talented. I mean, they're just... Incredibly, and by the way, mm-hmm. Mike Metavoy is a real, was a terrific leader at, at Orion, and a very classy man. Mm-hmm. And he used to have screenings at his house in L.A., mm-hmm. where he'd have really interesting people over, and they'd screen a movie in his living room, and you get to talk about the movie. And I was able to be on that list for a while, which was really nice. Nice, nice. Now we um, get to Mischief, celebrating its 35th anniversary. Um, I have loved this movie <clears throat> since I was like four or five years old. I watched it while my parents were asleep. <laughs> they wouldn't let you watch. That's very funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ke- Kelly was the first girl I ever saw naked when I was like four or five. Yeah, and even at four or five, you appreciated that, huh? 
I, I appreciated what I saw. Yes, I actually had a crush though on Kathy, and I told her I said, I, I, I wish I thought I was hoping that she was going to have a nude scene later in the movie, and it didn't happen. And she was like, "I'm, yeah. I'm so sorry to disappoint you." <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's wonderful. She and I are still in touch. Uh, she's doing great. I think she's back east now. Oh yeah, and uh, she she's um, <clears throat> becoming a director, and I'm trying, you know. It's, help her as much as I could with that it's something she really would like to do yeah oh my god I, I always have great conversations with her um, but how, how, did, how did this come to you uh, well I don't think it was because of yellow beard <laughs> but, uh, I think oh no you know what maybe it's if the yellow beard hadn't come out yet so it, it hadn't flopped yet so I think maybe the fact that I had done MASH and Yellowbeard made me eligible for this. And uh, I just, you know, I, it was a very good experience. Yeah. It's just, it, it was really, and, you know, I'm heartbroken right now. I've, I've got the People magazine sitting right here with Kelly's picture on the cover. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, every movie's a challenge. This one was a real challenge to find the location. This little town was so much a part of the story. And I looked over, all over North America and ended up finding a little town in Ohio that was perfect for the story because the, the town is a, a big part of the story. And it, it, it was a really good experience. Doug McKean was, you know, yeah, he was the actual age. I think he was a real version. Yeah. You might uh, <laughs> I did. I, I interviewed him last year. Yeah. You know, uh, on... on camera with Kelly. Mm -hmm. Did you find out if, if, did you follow up on that? Have you had a chance to interview Doug? I, I did interview Doug. I can't remember if he, if he told me he was a virgin. Cause I, I've done so many interviews. I can't remember every single thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I had worked with him years before that with the Brian Dennehy and, and another project, but what a, what a terrific kid. He, he, he you know, mm -hmm. uh, a very nice so, guy. That was a good experience, and uh, again, challenging. You know, we had to do a nude scene where the funny thing is, uh, oh God, should I tell this? <laughs> you tell any story you want. Okay, I'm going to tell this, and you can cut it out later if you think it's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, right before we started shooting, we were in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Kelly said, um, I don't want to do the nude scene. And I said, well, um, did you sign a contract with a nudity clause? Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, I did. I said, well, the problem is if you refuse to do the scene, they will shut down the movie and you'll be charged. And I, do you really want to go there? Yeah. She said, no, I don't think that would be a good idea. So she said, okay, I'll do it, but it has to be a closed set. The only one I want on that set is the camera operator. Right. And Doug and myself, when we do my nudity, right? So mm -hmm. we made a big announcement that day. We, we let them know the rules. Uh, she had a robe ready to put on, you know, between takes. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, you know, after take one, She's on the set without her without her robe on, right? Mm -hmm. Just right. standing there, topless, and the, everybody's walking around on the set, and it's like no biggie. It was right. it was incredible that uh, she just said, "You know what? I'm okay with this. I'm comfortable with this." Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I, you know, I love. I love directing that movie, I will say that. It was really fun for me. It's the kind of movie that I would really like to watch. You know, you don't always... I've just done 11 Hallmark movies in the last few years, and mm -hmm. that's not exactly the kind of movies that I would watch. Right. But I really like directing them, and some of them actually were engaging to me, you know? Not exactly my thing. Yeah. Mischief, mischief was more of my thing than a Hallmark movie. But... It was fun at this point in my life to be directing that many movies. Yeah. 
um, Noel Black, he, uh, did he write this based on a personal experience? Yes, he did. And it was interesting that they wouldn't let him direct it considering it was his life story. You know, how do you say to someone, you are not right to direct this movie? And he's thinking, well, actually, this is really my life story. And what? So, uh, and he came and visited me uh, when I was shooting in Ohio. And he was, he was a little rough on me, which I totally understand. Right. Right. But, but they were very happy when they saw the movie. So that was good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, but Kelly was, it was just... called Heart and Soul, which right. I preferred. Yeah. And that's, that's the movie that I wanted to make. And the poster that I had mm-hmm. was, the, was, was them in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in, the Studebaker. No, no, not, no, no. That's the one they use. This was them in the malt shop. Uh, just standing there with their arms around each other, right? And I wanted okay. to call it Heart and Soul, and that's, I made it under that title. And then Barry Diller came in, took over the studio, and he of course. wanted to make it more risque. And so they changed it to Mischief, and then they, the, the poster became, you know, exactly the shot you were talking about where they're making out in the car and she they fall out the door. Yeah, so, I, I always thought... What, yeah, I always thought that poster was kind of cheapened uh, by it because the movie was was the complete opposite of, of that, you know? Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. Thank you. That was exactly my point. It's not Porky's. What yeah. happened is Porky's had just come out and been a big hit, and so they tried to sell it as another Porky's. Mm-hmm. And it isn't Porky's. It's, you know, it's a, it's a coming-of-age story. I know it's completely different, you know. I mean, yeah. stuff happens, you know. I mean, he gets a hard on in class, and he's trying to hide it, you know. Yeah, uh, you know, but and not. He looks. He looks at. Yeah, he looks down onto the desk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stuff like that, but it's 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 not Porky's by any means. But um, yeah. Oh my God, Kelly was so talented. She is. She you know she plays. Uh, this superficial kind of slutty girl well because she's she's got this twinkle in her eye you know like 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 she's having fun with it yeah and she she was uh, going hot and heavy with her fiance at that time mm-hmm. but uh, that was before she met John right. and uh, she's from Hawaii she just really was wonderful to work with it was a really great experience for me. Mm-hmm. It was also too one of Jimmy Gertz's first rules. Yeah, and she's a she was feisty and she was great in the role. I thought. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get a chance to talk to her later on? No, I I I don't even know where she can be found. <laughs> I know. I was just wondering the same thing. I tried yeah. to. I tried to talk to D.W. Brown last year. Um, you know, he's he, he's got that big acting school in Santa Monica, and uh, I, I re- reached out to his wife. She gave me the, the number, and uh, one of the assistants there picked it up and stuff and said, okay, I'll let him know, and then uh, called me back later and said that he's, like, super busy now and stuff, you know. But maybe in the future, who knows? Yeah, again say hello. I had a good experience with him. He played Kenny. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was a fun part. Yeah, and Chris, and Chris Nash. Oh, what a mensch that guy is. He is. You know, he had no experience at all, right? I mean, that was mm-hmm. really... And But we're back in touch, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah, everybody involved in the movie is just nice. You know, even, even you are, Mel. I mean, just it was just... <laughs> It, that movie was it, true. It really was a good experience. I mean, and as you know, probably better than anyone from your interviews, it not, mm. isn't always that way. No. But this this was really a really fun experience for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I interviewed somebody yesterday uh, who, who did a very obscure movie I always loved, and he told me 
you know, basically he didn't say that he didn't want to talk about it, but he pretty much hinted it when he said that it was one of the worst experiences of his life and that um, uh, it wasn't a happy set or anything, you know, and that's, that's always disappointing, you know, but mischief. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just, it's full of synergy that just came together. Well, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I had that too. I, you know, let for one and put it back well. And she wanted to be fired. And the studio said, uh uh-uh. uh. If he goes, we shut down. And so she was just she would literally turn her back to me whenever I was giving her a direction. Mm-hmm. And storm off the set. And then she had a, a dialogue coach who would come to me and said, you know, she would say what Raquel wanted. And I would say, no, this is how we're doing it. And it was a nightmare experience. And what was so sad, it, and she was so rude to the Native Americans who we had her surrounded by, right? Because she plays a Native American. And it was exactly the opposite of what we were intending to do with this movie, right? Which right. is to paint these people as very human people who should not be looked at with it in any scornful way. And she was very scornful to them. And it was it just broke my heart. But I had to be there every morning and do it. Yeah. Record actress who wouldn't even talk to me. I've, I've, I've heard lots of negative stuff about Raquel Wells, you know, and that's really disappointing because, you know, she used to go on <clears throat> like the Dick Cavett show or something and she'd be so charming and she'd be very passionate about social causes, you know, and you would, you would think that uh, she was, a, she was such a lovely person, but I've just heard so much negativity about her. Oh my God. She was so disrespectful to, to, to everyone and me, me, include, especially me, of course, because I had final say on the set, which drove her crazy. Yeah. But it, it was just really sad. Mm-hmm. Was it, was, was it always raining over there in Ohio? On mischief? Yeah. No, it wasn't. I mean, we, you know, you see the, the it, it took forever, right, to find that town, right? Right. Because I needed it. It was so specific what happened in that town and the town square and all of that. But be able to look through the windows, store windows, things like that. Uh, I looked in Toronto. I looked all over, and I finally found this perfect town. But, you know, we didn't have too many weather problems. So it was enough good weather that, you know, we made it look bright and sunny as much as possible. Yeah, because every scene almost looks like um, overcast. Yeah. You know? Mm. <clears throat> and I've asked everybody else. You, mean, you talk about the exteriors? The, exterior, but, the exteriors, yeah. It looks like overcast weather. Uh-huh. Mm. Uh huh. It wasn't rainy, but it was. But, you know, uh, cinematographers like that. Yeah. Because bright and sun. Bright sun is really hard to control, especially because the sun moves all the time. So they they will put a lot of things on the camera, filters, to try to neutralize that. So they actually love to have, you know, slightly overcast, so it's easier for them lighting-wise than mm-hmm. bright sun. Yeah. Were you, uh, were you disappointed um, that the box office didn't do very well with the movie? Yes, I was. I thought it deserved there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, you know, and again, it has kind of created, had a cult following uh, over time. But I was disappointed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that Star Wars opening. Whose idea was that? That was me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was brilliant. You know, I'm sure I'm sure people who watched it on HBO was like, wait a minute, Star Wars is rated R. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Uh, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Ohio, 1956. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was neat. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> then you did a, a TV movie of the week about Pete Gray called A Winner Never Quits. Yes. With Keith Carradine. Keith Carradine. Um, I was a baseball star in high school mm-hmm. and uh, a little bit in college. And unfortunately, I went to 
college and upstate New York, which did not have good baseball weather. But, uh, and so this was a dream job for me. And it was going to keep our baby could not find a nicer leading man than Keith. And so it was, the whole thing was a honeymoon. It was really great. And, uh, but I'll tell you, it, this is an interesting thing. We shot in Chattanooga, Tennessee at a stadium. We could shoot everything in Chattanooga toward the batter's box and the stands, but we couldn't shoot toward the outfield because it had um, all these billboards with advertisements on them that they wouldn't cover. And I couldn't have that in a TV movie. So I had to have, you would see Keith standing in Long Beach, California on a mound, right? Mm -hmm. Drawing a pitch to the batter in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I had to do everything in Chattanooga first. I couldn't go back. So I had to get everything that happened, you know, toward the home plate in Chattanooga and then go to uh, come back to California and do the rest in California. So it was pretty tricky, but it works. The magic of cinema. (laughs) Yeah. How how did they hide uh, his arm for that? Well, it was just tucked in there. And, you know, he he really worked hard. Uh, He had to come really early and work on how to do that motion, right? Mm -hmm. Where he would tuck his glove under his arm and he was hit up obviously, and then put the ball on the chest grab. I mean, that motion was amazing, but he did it. Mm-hmm. And he got it, you know, uh, practice, practice, practice. Yep, he did really good with that. And um, Ed O'Neill, before Married with Children, plays his brother, the boxer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How, how was he to work yeah. with? Also, uh, really, everything about that movie was just wonderful. Mm-hmm. You know, here, here's the thing, Tommy. Yeah. A leading man is a mensch. It's very hard for anyone else to be a jerk. <laughs> that does, does make sense? sense. It does make sense, yeah. If the leading man is Wilfred Brimley and he's a he is a jerk, then it's, you know, trouble. Because you then you're gonna have all kinds of problems from other people. But when someone is a prince like Keith Carradine, who grew up in this wonderful, you know, family of very talented people mm-hmm. and is very classy. No one else can misbehave. And you had a bad experience with Wilfred Brimley? I had a horrible experience. Oh. I, I mean, the movie came out okay. I mean, he's a talented guy, yeah. but not a fun guy to work with. He just passed away, sadly. Yeah. But was not, uh, was not a mensch. He, uh, he was very close with Robert Duvall, mm-hmm. and he he learned something from Bobby Duvall that he only liked to do one take. He would not do a second take. Mm-hmm. Now, I tend to think of myself as a two-take director, and that is uh, the actor does. I don't give a lot of notes to an actor before they do the first take, mm-hmm. and then I give them a note. And then they take the note and get it on take two, print, move on, right? Right. Even if it's perfect on take one, I'll still do another take and give them a chance to try something different, Mm -hmm. right? Well, Wilford would only do one take. So we had a signal, and I would signal the focus puller, and the focus puller would say, oh, I need another. (laughs) (laughs) And we would basically zoom in on him and, and get, I mean, he wouldn't even do coverage. Or we would, you know what I mean? He didn't believe in doing coverage. And he said, he, he said that's how my friend Bobby Duvall does it. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what he said. And that's the way I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. One take. So I had to, you know, come up with this crazy way to get either a second take or a tighter shot. But yeah. he comes off well on you know, because he's got talent. Mm-hmm. It's not fun to work with. That's sad. I almost met him at a convention a couple of years ago, and his line was out the door. I I didn't get to meet him. But yeah, 
I remember uh, being the little kid watching A Hero in the Family on ABC Disney. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Oh, God. I just remember that chimp riding the motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How's that chimp to work with? <laughs> Unbelievable. How, how incredibly tra- well trained it was. Just amazing. Yeah, his name was Orville. Yeah, it was really amazing. I, I, I was so, you can imagine how nervous I was, right? Mm-hmm. But, but, uh, yeah, it was, you just never know, right? I mean, that's the whole thing about a movie. You, you know, you're not, most people go to work. My wife's a teacher, right? She works with the same people all the time. Mm-hmm. A movie, you're with a different group of people every movie and and all kinds of egos, and it can really be a, a honeymoon or a real challenge. Yeah. You had the Cliff D. Young. He's an underrated actor. He is, yeah. Uh, very, talent, I think, talented. Do you agree? Very talented. And a lot of people don't know, he uh, was the lead singer of a psychedelic band in the 60s. Yeah, what was it called? Do you remember? Crystal Light. Wow. They <clears throat> were compared to the Doors because they were this dark psychedelic band, and yet they were also on the same label and had the same producer. Wow. Mm-hmm. Was he? The, he was the lead singer. He was the he lead. Was the, he Jim was Morrison of the of that group. <laughs> I would say he was Jim Morrison, but yeah, he was the lead singer. <laughs> It came in handy for later when he did uh, the the Rocky Horror uh, sequel, Shock Treatment. Right. You know. And then um, you worked with Kathy again on Murder by the Book. You know what I'm doing? I'm cheating. I'm looking at on the <laughs> Pro when you're talking about this stuff because yeah, I've got some. A lot of people so do, can, so everyone cheats. My memory. Yeah, Murder by the Book, uh, where Robert Hayes, he's the detective, and then he's the other guy. He's the 1940s detective and the other guy. Yeah, and by the way, Robert Hayes, again, wonderful guy. Yes, I've met him. Yeah. You, you did? Yeah, I met him at a convention a couple of years ago, and I wanted to ask him uh, questions, but he was asking me questions the whole time. <laughs> Well, you do have a lot of, uh, you know, mm-hmm. it's true with a lot of people. I'm having the same thing with you a little. Yeah. Yeah. I heard he lost his house in the Malibu fires. Yeah. Which is sad. Wow. Yeah. He's there are new fires. Did you hear the news today? Out towards Riverside. We had we had some pretty bad fires over here in Reading. I had to be evacuated for a couple of days. That was scary. Wait, recently? I'm in 2018. Oh, no, I knew about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. How, how does um, Happy Together come to you? Happy Together was really fun. I'm looking at a poster for it right now in my home office. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a challenge because Patrick had a acting coach with him mm-hmm. whom he had a personal relationship with. I yeah. think she was about 50 and he was in his 20s. Yeah. And so he, it was hard to direct him when he had his acting coach with him all the time. And that was a real challenge. But I think it turned out, well, what do you think? It's, I haven't seen it in a long time. but Me neither, but I, uh, from what I remember, it was a pretty it was a pretty funny, good movie. Yeah. Helen was great. It was a, a pleasure. Joe Pinella, who's one of my closest friends, uh, shot it. We mm. were at film school together in Denver, so that was great that I was able to work with Joe. He's still working all the time. He's very successful. 
and it was supposed to be like a, a non-musical version of Cabaret. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Which I find very interesting, yeah. Yeah. How, how did you... Yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. No, you go, you go. I was going to say, how did you how did you uh, go about casting Marius Weirs? What, what do you mean? How did I go about casting it? Casting? Well, he was he was known for the Gods Must Be Crazy. Right. He's a he's a great actor. Like like how, how did he come up to be cast? Oh, I don't remember, but it was you know obviously. Like you said, very talented person. So that was it. That was easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, he's one of those guys that uh, that I'd like to inter- to interview. You know, because I love that movie. And um, yeah, I, I think he's very he's very underrated too. Yes. Here, look. Wait, I'm looking up. I think other right now. Yeah, there's Marius. Mm-hmm. Very interesting guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, <clears throat> then you did <clears throat> you did some episodes of Picket Fences. That is not. I mean, it's hard because I've done so much to sing out anything, but that's one of the things I'm proudest of. Mm-hmm. Because David Kelly is such an amazing writer, and the content was great. Mm-hmm. And and the the cast was wonderful. I mean, you could not ask for better experience. And to get to do so many episodes was just amazing for me. It was really, uh, yeah. Tom Skerritt lives up here in Washington, and um, yeah, but- cast him in, in one of my Hallmark movies, uh, Christmas movies, and it was so great. And he's starting a kind of a production company to do uh, interesting films. And so we're, you know, we're trying to figure out how to do something together. Yeah, my uncle knows him a little really bit. Yeah, my uncle lives on the lives on the island in Washington. He knows uh, Tom Skerritt a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Tom's been here forever, way longer than I have, and he's just a really good guy. Yeah. Did uh, the Five-ish Finkel make everyone laugh all day? Uh, unbelievable. unbelievable. I just loved him so much. Yeah. You know, I'm a New Yorker. He's a New Yorker. You know, we just loved hanging out together. <laughs> what a pleasure to have to work with someone like that. <laughs> He's just, he was just great. Just he, he he was he was just perfect for that show, you know. And then he did another series, David E. Kelly produced a couple of years later, where he played a racist teacher, and he had some good moments on there too, though. But just as Wombog, picket fences. I mean, that was just gold. Yes, it was exactly right. Yeah, and you know he was already getting up there in age, so you know had to be take it nice and slow with him and you know mm-hmm. uh, the, the funny thing is dialogue all the time so I had to have two cards for, for him right Right. and that's not an easy thing because you're looking at the person you're doing the scene with right and then right. you move your eyes slightly to the right to see the cue cards right mm-hmm. and you've got to do it in a way that your head is back where it should be before you say the line Right. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it can't use it. Right. So I have to say, OK, uh, cut. And I'd say five ish. can't be looking at the cue card and saying one at the same time. You know, you got to take that beat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and of course, then he would get it right. But because he was getting up there in age. But boy, was he great to work with. Yeah. Ray Walsh and the two of them together were were great. Ray was amazing as the judge. I mean, can you imagine me as a young director getting to work with the likes of Ray Walston? I mean, it's just amazing. He was, again, the content was so good. You know, I got to move. I I, I put more movement into it, which at first they they were a little nervous about, but they got got to really like it. 
and that's why they kept asking me back for more episodes. Mm-hmm. I didn't want it to just be a bunch of close-ups of people talking in the courtroom. Yeah. No, I wanted. I tried to make the you know obviously the judge and the jury can't move around. Right. But you know the, the, I tried to put a lot of movement into the show, and they really like that, and so that's why I got to come back a lot. Michael Pressman, who brought me in on the show, was wonderfully supportive. Oh, that's good. He'd be a great guy for you to talk to, by the way. He's teaching. He lives in Maine now, mm-hmm. but he's uh, he's still working. He's doing a show in Chicago, and he's got, had an amazing career. Oh, yeah. New Yorker. <clears throat> I love, um, he did Dr. Detroit and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Yeah, he'd be a fun If you want me to connect you to him, I can. Sure, I'd love to talk to him. That'd be great. How was, how was working with Holly Marie Combs? Great. Wonderful. She was delightful. Yeah. I, I had kind of a weird experience meeting her at a convention a couple of years ago. Um, uh, she did something a lot of celebrities uh, do when they're when when the when the fan is getting just a picture only. She just you know posted the picture. Did, it just you know she kind of uh, rudely didn't even you know have the have the courtesy to like you know just uh, shake uh, shake your hand and say hi or anything like that. It was just it was very awkward. I felt. Holly, you're talking about Holly. Yeah. Really, mm-hmm. I'm really surprised because. Uh, she was definitely the quietest one, yeah. but very professional. Uh, so I'm surprised to know that she was difficult in any way, because well, uh, with me, she was a pleasure. Well, you know, I mean, the, I mean, a lot of these, these stars, when they do conventions, they meet a lot of weird people and stuff, and I get that, you know, but sometimes you just got to, you know, be a little bit nicer. And if you do it, uh, run into somebody... Who's who's crazy or weird or anything? That's why security is there. You know, you just gotta, you know, let yourself go sometimes. Right. You know, yeah. with ease. You know, I I don't know, but that's that's. I mean, what... charmed. You know, I did so many charmed. Yeah. Episodes, and it was really Shannon was the, was the the challenge on that one. Mm-hmm. Holly Marie. Uh, Alyssa were, were great, um, but then Shannon and and Alyssa did not get along well. Yeah. And so, they, so the way I heard it was Aaron Spelling said that, uh, you know, he gave the producers a choice. Who do you want to keep? Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, 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 Alyssa... And they decided Shannon was the one. Oh, no, I know what it was. It's even more interesting. They mm-hmm. hired somebody to be on set and watch what happened. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I never knew there was a job like that. And the guy, after a week, said the issue is with Shannon. Wow. And, and so Shannon went, and then that's when, you know, they recast her part with Rose. Mm-hmm. So the next season we had Rose in the part. And I, I worked with Shannon after that, and I think that she was a pleasure. So I don't know what was going on. There was some kind of just chemistry issue there at that point. Yeah. And, you know, think about it. You're in the trenches every day like that. You know, if mm-hmm. there's a, it, a personality problem, that that's really a challenge. It is, yeah. So did you um, have any projects lined up that got shelved because of COVID? Awesome. 
Wow, congratulations. What what made you want to write a play so later in life? Because uh, a story came into my head, and, mm. it's, uh, and it wasn't a movie. It's about a, an old, cranky old man who won't get out of his hospital bed, and his got a young black nurse who said, Max, you got to get out of bed, and she, I'm tired of wiping your butt. And he said, give me one good reason why I should get out of this bed, because he's very disheartened by things in the family and the world. Mm. And she says, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, her call button goes off, and she brings in his new caretaker, who is a robot named C. And Max said, no, I had a robot. He was a putz. He didn't know what the word putz even meant. And C says, he was a B, and I am C, a C, and I am programmed to be compatible with you. We're going to get along just fine. Mm -hmm. B says, I'll leave you two gentlemen alone. She leaves. She comes back 10 minutes later. Not only is Max out of bed, but he, they're up and singing together. Copa, Copa, Cabana. Right? They're getting along famously, except, and here's what the play's about. Mm -hmm. C wants Max to sign a consent form that when his body gives out, they can preserve his brain in a hard drive. And Max said, no, I'm a humanist. I'm not going to do that. And that's the challenge of the play. Because that's going to be an issue someday. So it's a futuristic play. Nice, nice. Well, I hope that play uh, continues to be successful for you and that after COVID is over, you can get back to work because, gosh, I, I just I can't believe that this is happening, you know. Well, this is much more serious than we thought it would be. And uh, it's, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing and you get to do that from home. And so that's really good. But uh, obviously for a lot of my wife's a teacher and she doesn't like teaching remotely via Zoom. I mean, it's better than nothing. Yeah. But still, the kids lose out on so much socialization. And, you know, that's a big part of growing up is not just academics. So it's, it's a very challenging time. It is. Luckily, I have my new puppy with me, Rosie. So that's like, she's here. She's right here at my feet. Oh, that's awesome. Well, Mel, thank you so much for coming on today. This was really great. Oh, thanks, Tommy. And listen, if you want to get in touch with any of these people, let me, you have my email, let me know, and I'll try to hook you up with some of them, okay? I sure will. Thank you so much, sir, and stay safe, and have a yes. great day. You too. Be healthy, and uh, we'll get through this. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Well, there you have it. Mel Damsky. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, nice man, and he makes great movies and shoots great episodes of television. And that's, that's really amazing. He went from a journalist to a director. Wow. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.